is going to get started with uh, Willow. And with that, I'm going to turn over the reins, meaning this fella and this fella for the rest of that. Uh, Andrew, you can get started on the recording, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, enjoy. All right. Can you guys hear me if I just stand here and don't speak into the microphone? Is that okay? Andre, is that cool by you? All right, great. Andre can hear me too. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ian Siegel, um, and I'm with a company called Willow. Um, Willow is kind of a new type of hybrid company that uh, uh, we sort of have one foot in the consulting and services side of the business, and then we also are a, uh, a technology uh, software developer as well. Um, and what we're basically doing is we work directly with real estate developers and owners of major infrastructure assets to uh, establish with them a digital strategy and get the most out of the, uh, the design and construction process in terms of technology. So we basically take on a role that's similar to an owner's rep um, with regards to the BIM and the, uh, the digital aspects of a project. So what we basically do is we, we partner with these owner developers um, the question that we aim to answer is basically how do we develop smart buildings and smart infrastructure? Um, what we're starting to see in the market is basically that uh, everyone wants a smart result, whether it's a building or an infrastructure asset that's under development. Everyone wants a smart result, but not only do very few people and companies know how to deliver a smart building, um, but very few companies or owners even really know how to define exactly what they mean by a smart building. So a lot of times we start the process with what is it that, uh, that you're looking to get out of the process. Um, and then we turn that into very practical uh, steps, a very practical and achievable digital strategy that the architect and the engineering design team would follow in terms of things like BIM standards. And speaking to a, a BIM group, so you guys understand BIM execution plans. We help craft the requirements and the plans for the, the design teams and the construction teams in order to deliver those outcomes. Um, one, what's kind of interesting is uh, the question of what, what is a smart building? If you go to any smart building conference, every presenter shows this building as part of their, uh, as part of their deck. Do you guys recognize this building? Here, show of hands. How many of you guys recognize the edge? Okay, so cool. So we're speaking to a room primarily of design architects, right? If those are most of the arms that went up. Um, so architectural record, I don't think, wrote about this building, but Bloomberg magazine. Um, established, they, they wrote an article that basically described this building as the best example of the Internet of Things at play in a commercial office building. So a couple things that this building does, Deloitte is the anchor tenant, and they were actually a driver behind a lot of the smarts of this building. So uh, no one at Deloitte has their own assigned seat at this building. They can show up to work and sit wherever in the building they want to. That's a topic, uh, that's a concept called hot desking. Uh, so they could sit wherever they want to. They have a smartphone or a, a, a mobile app on their phone that allows them to do things like control the lighting and the temperature in their immediate environment. The building is decked out with fences that were developed by Philips uh, a lot of times in the lighting um, that are basically doing things like tracking uh, occupancy. So it's able to tell rooms that are occupied versus unoccupied. It's able to sense things like what's the temperature and the humidity in any given space. And through your mobile app, you're able to set your preferences. So as you move from place to place in the building, the building knows where you're sitting and what your preferences are and is able to work in the background in order to deliver uh, a, a temperature and a, 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 an environment that's most comfortable to you. So the idea here is that these workers are happier at work. They're more productive uh, because they have control over their immediate environment. So the building is collecting and churning through and, uh, and acting on all of this information. That's what you see in the bottom right-hand corner is basically a, a database that, that's acting on all this information. And what's really fascinating to me anyway is that in the middle bottom slide here, you can see uh, this is basically a Roomba. This is a robotic vacuum cleaner that drives through the building every night, and it'll drive right past a conference room or a space that hasn't been used over the course of the day because the building is tracking all of these metrics about the way that it's used. So we recognize that the, uh, the, um, a smart building is going to benefit two major user groups. There's the facility manager, there's the owner of the building who needs to maintain and, uh, and perform maintenance on this facility. And then on the, other side, on the other hand, it's the people that are using the building. So the tenants, the residents, uh, the customers, passengers, what have you. And so the concept that's, that's at play here is that of a digital twin. Digital twin is kind of a new term in the building industry, but this is something that's been going on for a long time, actually, in uh, aviation manufacturing, like jet engines. 
basically you have a physical asset, you have a physical building, and you have all of these sensors that are collecting information in real time, and they're reporting back to a, a digital version of the building, a digital replica, hence the term twin, uh, of the building. So being the New York City Revit user group, you guys understand that building information modeling is, uh, we might call this an as-built uh, model of the building. But when you're connecting to live data sources, whether it's the building maintenance system, uh, the building automation system, uh, an IoT uh, sensor network, um, as soon as you start to visualize and put all these things into context, um, you have what's called a digital twin of the building. And that's where we ultimately play. If you look at Google Maps, it's basically an underpinning um, of, uh, of the entire world. And as soon as you start to add other smart data sources, uh, whether it's things like GPSs or mobile apps, you're able to drive these smarter outcomes on top of the Google map, uh, things like Uber or Yelp with live restaurant reviews. Uh, so what we're ultimately recognizing is that if we were to go back from Google Maps to the paper map, if you're going to drive, uh, pull over on the highway and pull out your paper map to navigate. Imagine how, how far a step back in time you're taking from turn by turn navigation. Well, in the same way, we're building up these structured data models, building information models from design through construction. How come we're flattening these out into a set of PDFs and handing those over to the owner at the end of the day? What we basically recognize is the reason that every single building that's developed, developed today doesn't have a digital twin is because of the siloed nature of our industry. And so that's where the Willow business comes into play. We have a team that provides services that we call digital project management. Uh, and what we ultimately do, like I mentioned before, is we partner with the developer as an owner's rep, and we oversee the BIM and digital aspects of the design and construction process uh, to make sure that they have a fully functional digital twin that's ready to drive down their operational efficiencies on day one of opening the building and drive some smarter outcomes for the people who are going to use the facility as well. So what we basically do is we take information from a wide variety of sources, we structure it up into a way that can drive much smarter outcomes for the facility management team, for the owner, and for the people who are going to use the building. So the software platform that we've developed has three distinct products that fall under that, uh, that suite. There's the build product, which is basically uh, the way that contractors and our digital project management team construct a digital twin while the building is being built. Um, and then there's the operate and the experience apps, which are basically used uh, by the facilities teams and the users of the building, respectively. Uh, so this is what our, our build platform looks like. Basically, as construction data about uh, the key maintainable assets comes in from the construction team, you enter information. Uh, during the commissioning stage, when the BMS comes online, we're able to map each data point to uh, basically its respective mo uh, model element in the, uh, in the 3D model. We're able to use QR codes as a way of accessing that live data and static O&M manual data uh, for each piece of equipment. Um, and here's just a, a quick video of what it looks like during operations. So I'll, I'll let it spin around. Uh, this is not Revit. This all comes from a Revit model and a, a federated BIM, um, but it all takes place in a, a, a web browser. So it's a very lightweight viewer of the 3D model. What we're doing right now, I know it's difficult for you guys to see here, but we're basically doing like an e-retail style search of all of the assets in the building. So you might say, I want to go to level three, I want to find a specific pump, and it narrows down our entire asset list all the way down to those three or four specific pieces of, uh, of key maintainable assets. What you're seeing here is you're seeing that pump in the context of the system that it, uh, that it belongs to. So we're going to turn on the rest of the plumbing system in just a second here. And what you're seeing on the lower half of the screen is all the information that's important to a facilities manager. You're seeing things like the date that it was installed, the name and the contact information for the subcontractor that installed it, uh, when the warranty expires. Um, you're also seeing things like live data. So you're able to see information coming through from the BMS, like what's the pressure inside that system, what's the temperature inside the pump right now. Um, and then in just a second, we're going to click on uh, the, the maintenance tab here. Oh, of course, you're able to kind of change that information as a uh, as you're updating the building and as you perform maintenance, you're able to see an entire history of who's performed maintenance on that particular piece of equipment. Um, and then you're also able to tag documents, so things like warranty data, O&M manuals, so that you're able to, to see all the information that you would need. Uh, so your facilities team spends less time looking for the source of the problem, and they have all the information at their fingertips uh, when it's time for them to perform maintenance.
So what we're able to do is once we kind of align this with, uh, with utility cost information, we're able to prioritize rather than just being BMS information about where problems might be, we're able to locate the piece of equipment and then even uh, quantify in a dollar amount how expensive these problems are if we're not gonna take care of them right away. But focusing on the users, 65% of people say that they uh, want to live in a smart city. JLL did a study just a couple of years ago. Um, this is called the 330-300 principle, which is actually kind of fascinating for everyone in the building industry to kind of be aware of. So an average organization spends $3 per square foot each year on utilities. So the energy management and optimization kind of stuff that I just mentioned, so being able to perform predictive maintenance, that's actually only applicable to, to about $3 per square foot each year. The same organization spends on average $30 per square foot on their rent each year and $300 per square foot on their payroll, on the people that are employed by this particular organization. So if you're able to make a dent in that 30 or 300 zone, basically if a smart building is able to make your workers more productive or is able to kind of uh, drive up the, the quality of the real estate that they're buying, that's where the smart building market really has the, the most uh, potential to create more bang for your buck. So basically tying into a digital twin are the opportunities for things like room booking. You guys are all used to using Revit. You can easily see your room schedule based on the entire, uh, the entire project. Feed that into your room booking system after uh, occupancy is complete. Um, in the same way, if we're tying in live data systems, not just the BMS, but things like uh, security turnstiles, um, destination dispatch elevator systems, if we're able to plug those kinds of things in there, you can use things like QR codes or Bluetooth as a way of being able to get into the building uh, rather than having to sign in at the security desk. You could do things like call an elevator. If you're in a rush to get to your next meeting and uh, it's a couple blocks away and your Uber is waiting for you downstairs, call the elevator from your desk and you know you've got 30 seconds to get to the lift lobby um, and, and you're able to get there faster. But the real, uh, I think the real exciting thing about all of these things is the ability to string that functionality together, right? So if you're coming to visit my office uh, for a meeting, I can send you a QR code. You're already registered with the front desk. You can use that QR code to get through the turn style. The elevator is called and it automatically knows to take you to the fourth floor because uh, that's where the hub at Grand Central Tech is. And as soon as those elevator doors open up, you're able to look down at your mobile device and see a Google Maps style floor plan guiding you exactly to the conference room where I'm waiting for you. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking to lay a groundwork for. Um, so just kind of hopping forward, because uh, I know I'm over time at this point, but uh, th these are able to kind of uh, support things like the, the wellness initiatives that more and more companies are, are looking to take on. These are able to make buildings safer um, in the world that we live in today, where there might be a, a disaster or an emergency situation cell phones can automatically notify you, not just where the closest exit is, but maybe where the safest exit is. Uh, it's possible that the closest exit is, uh, is guiding you towards the danger. Um, and then of course, what this ultimately is able to do is uh, provide landlords and, uh, and building owners with uh, better information about the way that their spaces are utilized. So they can uh, kind of be strategic about the way that they might rearrange their space. Uh, that's it for now. Sorry for running over time. Uh, my name's Ian Siegel with Willow. Thank you guys. Uh, so yeah, I'm standing in the back for, for both of you to present. I'm standing in the back for like signaling minutes, right? Um, and yeah, there's a lot of people coming after me, so straight to the last slide. Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Schumacher. I'm a co-founder of Constru. Constru uh, was started a good year and a half ago um, with the main target of, uh, or, or our main, yeah, it's a product, sorry, I should start. 
here. It's a product um, for mainly for BIM users, architects and engineers, um, with the goal of managing design changes and also managing data transfer between different platforms. Um, and we can, there we go. Okay, so I'm showing this uh, slide that everyone in the room has seen many times before. I'm showing it uh, just for this uh, particular curve, cost of design changes. So this, you know, the, uh, the McLeamy diagram essentially um, uh, tells you that design changes become more expensive as the project um, as the project time kind of goes on and as we approach the construction phase of the project. Um, and also, I think I, I drew this part. This was not McLeamy, but I think um, I think that the you know BIM is here to stay, and and uh, the BIM aspect of projects um, is sort of increasing in both directions. And more and more companies are using BIM on more and more projects uh, to higher and higher extent. So um, this is for the Revit user group. Yay, BIM! BIM is here to stay. Um, and I think um, you know that's that's essentially a great asset for us. That means uh, the data is becoming more structured, or at least it could become more structured if we use it correctly. Um, but still, even though we're using digital assets more and more, the cost of design changes still goes up. And that's mainly because in the very beginning of a project, we don't have much information yet. We have some programming and masking information, maybe some soil conditions. And towards the end of the project, we have you know fire ratings and exact material definitions and all those kind of things, wind studies. So transferring, making, you know, Changes to the building just becomes more expensive because all these things need to be updated, and we're working on reducing that those changes, those, uh, those the cost for those changes. So you know we thought it shouldn't be this way. We have all these digital assets, and we should be able to use them more intelligently. And uh, yeah, that's essentially why um, why we started comes through. Um, we can talk about more how it started during the Q and A, but I'm just going to talk about what it does. Um, so comes through at this point has eight different plugins. We're growing the number of plugins for different tools that we support. Um, you know, Grasshopper, Revit, Tecla, ETAP, Excel, and others are supported already, as well as a number of structural analysis tools. And essentially, you can use those plugins to upload data into the Construct Cloud and then download it again as well. So you could, um, you know, send some information from a Revit model into Construct and then download it into Tecla, okay, which is great, which is what IFC does. Um, but the big difference is that we provide um, very high level of control over the kind of data that gets exchanged. So instead of just dumping a whole IFC file into your, into your model and figuring out what made it and what didn't make it, we can give you the, you know, the kind of filters that say, well, this time I'm only interested in, um, you know, importing beams, but no columns. And for the slabs, I only want to uh, import material changes, but no geometry changes. So you can specify what kind of information should make it back and forth between these different programs. Here's a really short video of importing a change. Oh, let's say of of importing a change into uh, into Revit. And essentially, we're downloading a construct model into Revit, and we see that only one column was changed, and it's highlighting that column in the UI. And it also tells us, I don't know if you can see that, that the profile information for this column is going to change from a W12 to W8 section. Should I accept the change? So you really get to you can really use information coming from other models much more easily. Um, and then the, the second half of this part is, like I said, we can set filters and we can say, well, actually, the next time that I'm going to, you know, export my Revit model because I want to use it for, you know, some other purpose, for the structural analysis, for example, I do not want to export slabs, for example. So we can filter out the floor slabs, and then when we press the upload button, it will export the model without slabs. So again, you can, you can really in, um, understand what, get, what gets imported and also, also pick that. Um, which is great. Okay, so now we can take a Revit model. Does it mean three are in? Two more? Okay, good. So let's not talk about Fox News then. Um, but um, essentially, um, you know, great. So now we can take a Revit model and we can turn it into a fabrication model fairly easily. But the, the problem is if the Revit model is not good enough, whatever that means, then the fabrication model will not be useful or the structural analysis model will not be useful. Um, so a big issue oftentimes we find with, with turning Revit models into analysis models is that Revit modelers don't really care about connectivity. So if I have my, my beam and my column, they don't necessarily connect at the right location. They may just be slightly you know, separated. So if I run a structural analysis and I apply load to this element, it's not going to work the way that it should. So what we need to do is we need to clean up the model and prepare it for analysis. 
and um, we have um, developed a, a UI for that. So essentially, the idea is yes, we can generate data in Revit, for example, but now we can actually make it usable for fabrication or for analysis, and vice versa. So we can run it through our model repair um, feature. In this case, it's uh, it's just highlighting all the nodes where um, elements are not fully connected to a to another major node in the building. Um, so it's identifying kind of problematic areas, and then I can apply certain rules to fix to repair the model. Um, then it's, pre it's previewing which elements are going to be affected based on my rules that I just set up. It's then giving me a little summary of what is about to change. Like, hey, I just merged 44 nodes. It's hard to see from back there. And then when I say, okay, this looks great, it's then going to repair the model and it's going to highlight in the viewer which elements were modified. So now I can bring this into analysis and it actually will run. Um, okay, so that's the first part. Probably one minute left. So the other thing that, that we focus on a lot is change management. Um, you know, I develop a lot of software and, and, and so did so do so do other people that, that helped um, over the years work on this product. And we, you know, we learned from the software industry, especially from the open source industry, that it shouldn't be so hard to control all these changes. You know, you have all these different people in all these different locations of the world collaborating on the same piece of code, um, which is essentially the same thing as, as contributing to the same project database. But it's a lot easier because they use certain tools that enable them to understand who did what change when and why. And, um, and so we took those, those ideas and we brought them into Construe. And essentially every time that you make, that you upload a model, you can visualize, you know, what just changed, what was added or deleted or modified. Um, and, and so as you kind of grow your project over time, and this is just scrolling through the timeline, you can see all the additions and changes and deletions that were made. Um, and then if you enter one of these, um, one of these particular you know, versions of history or instances of history, you can then again kind of zoom in and understand what was changed. And you can even go as far as preparing a change report and share it with others via email and let them download, you know, a text file of all the changes if they want, if they want something text based or just look at it in 3D. Um, you can also change your settings and say, I'm actually not interested in visualizing certain kinds of changes. Don't, I don't care if the name was changed, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, so to summarize, um, Yes, there are some solutions like I see that may work in the beginning of, a, of the project phase, but not so much when you have to make kind of more informed or more, more granular updates. And Construal is really built with the idea of going all the way from schematic design all the way to fabrication. Um, so showing this, this, uh, this slide again. So our, you know, we, we really saw an opportunity knowing that everything is becoming digital and that, that the BIM curve is growing in both directions and we just think you shouldn't have to remodel models so many times. You shouldn't have to build a new Tecla model if there's already a usable Revit model, et cetera, et cetera. And the cost of design changes should be manageable because everything is, you know, is digital. So that's what we will construe. Thank you very much. Seven, eight. Hi, hi, thank you. Hi. I'm Eli, I'm co uh, one of the co founders at OnTarget. Uh, essentially, we are a 40 and 5D um, platform for the construction industry. So we're utilizing Revit and BIM, uh, BIM models to track progress um, on the construction site. Um, this is essentially just a little bit of what we're doing. So 
you may be asking how does 5D play into tracking progress uh, with the schedule. So, but if you think about your 5D um, estimate, essentially you have all the quantities of that project. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're labeling all the different elements within a building itself or in the, in the BIM model, whether it's concrete, if it's a cubic yard, if it's, if it's drywall square foot, square feet. Um, and then essentially what we're doing is we're, instead of going to the, the schedule itself and you know, tracking the progress on the schedule. Now we have our users in the field. Uh, we're putting the Revit models on, on the, uh, the iPad and they're just quickly clicking on different elements and tracking the progress directly from the, uh, the model itself. And we find this to be a much more scientific way and quantitative way to track progress versus um, just going to a particular task and then updating it, say 50%. If you, if you think about if I have two walls, that's 10 square, square feet of uh, drywall, if I click on one, update it to 100%, then essentially that task in itself would be 50% done. So that's more or less um, the value prop of what we're doing. Um, but before we can do this, we have to basically digitize. And the good thing about you know being a part of uh, this group here is you guys are obviously doing uh, BIM and uh, Revit. So you guys have uh, completed the first step, so good job. <laughs> um, the next step is standardizing. So the way we're standardizing the schedules and the BIM models and elements are around cost codes. The reason we're doing this around cost codes is the ultimate goal of this is to tie in the progress payments. You don't have to worry about overbilling your subcontractors, your clients, and then know exactly what percent complete, what they should be uh, paying on the project. And the ultimate goal that we're working on right now is, uh, is the third, is automation. So basically from photographs and uh, LiDAR scans, you can autom automatically update your, your uh, progress on site. Uh, we have this in beta right now. Uh, we've work, been working on it for the last six months, it's about 30% accurate, um, but we believe in the next six or eight months, it'll be accurate enough to actually deploy. So we think it's uh, a pretty cool feature that will uh, be released. You don't have to worry about uh, updating your schedule anymore because as a former project manager, uh, it was like pulling teeth to get uh, progress updates from superintendents. So uh, we're just going to automate the progress. Uh, this is more or less kind of uh, how our integrations work. So we have integrations with Procore. Um, and this is more on the predictive analytics side of things. So we're, we're aggregating all the RFIs and submittals, uh, daily reports, change orders, and we're essentially a, <clears throat> applying those to the schedule to see how they're going to impact. Um, if an RFI is affecting this element or this, this task, essentially we're, we're going to know that. And then we're going to basically raise, raise the, uh, the flag saying you might want to get this RFI uh, answered because it's going to actually impact your schedule because it's associated with a task with zero float. We have other uh, integrations with Autodesk, um, and we also integrate with uh, both Oracle and uh, MS Project. So if you uh, do your scheduling in either P6 or MS Project, and simply drag and drop your, um, your, your schedule in our system, and it'll populate on our cloud platform, and you can begin uh, updating your schedules directly from the cloud, uh, and the entire schedule will live also on your mobile, mobile device. Um, so this is a case study we did with some of our clients. Essentially, uh, overall, we saved projects about seven hours per week when it came to training schedules, updating schedules. Um, so this was kind of over the life. So based on the, uh, we charge this project, ROI was around 750%. Um, and this is a, kind of highlighting uh, some of our clients uh, right now. We're at the World Trade Center uh, with Judd Lau, um, one of our biggest projects. We've been, uh, working very close to this uh, Hollister construction. Um, and we were able to um, predict three, three uh, major delays that ended up saving them uh, quite a bit of money. So uh, there's just some of the publications. So more or less that's uh, on target in a nutshell. So thank you.
All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Bowden. I'm a co-founder of Pansophic, one of the companies here located at the hub. We're an Internet of Things company. We're focused on smart buildings, smart cities, and hence the invite for me today to talk to all of you. Now, so what do we do? Uh, quite simply, we're a sensor to cloud data delivery service. Uh, we deliver that data to do one thing, to optimize building operations. Um, we, we've developed a suite of sensors um, and the means to connect those sensors to the cloud where we can then deliver uh, that data to our customers, which are building owners. Um, and then we can do some pretty neat things with that one. Of course, we can display that data uh, with some nice visualizations to help to optimize operations. We can do things like alerting. So we can, do, uh, uh, we, can, we can help with the maintenance situation. So we've done things, for example, like detect water leaks and give instantaneous alerts that, hey, you've got a water leak in such and such a location, you need to go there now and fix that water leak. So that's an example of what we can do. We do machine learning, predictive analytics. Machine learning, predictive analytics are pretty much in the same family of things, but what we can do, for example, is if you've got rotating machinery, we can monitor that rotating machinery, we can predict if it's going into a failure mode, let you know once again, so you can do proactive maintenance. In the long run, you're gonna save money. Um, uh, business rules, so, you know, if you set, want to set temperature thresholds for a particular room, we can do things like that. Um, and then finally, uh, we can provide an API, which then you can use to send some third party. It could be a building management system or what have you. So you can take this building sensor data and then you can deliver it to the BMS and then have them do what have you. Uh, and control actuators and so forth to, once again, optimize the, the building performance. So that's what we do. Um, the type of sensors that we have available, well, you can think of it, we pretty much do it. I mentioned water leaks, for example, but we also do water consumption. Two of the primary uh, costs associated with the building are, are, are uh, energy and water. So we do things like we do water submetering for multifamily buildings. Um, and we deliver that, that data up into the cloud, and we can detect um, if water leaks occur that way. So if somebody leaves the bathtub running, and we see an unusual event where, you know, for the past 30 minutes, the water's been running, we can let you know. Um, we can do power consumption. We can do environmental monitoring, which is a very uh, popular uh, uh, thing we do. And the sensor that you see right there uh, is one of the, things, one of the uh, examples of, of an environmental sensor that we have. That one has a PIR, so we can do actual occupancy, we can do space utilization, uh, we can do CO2, we can do VOCs. You know, a lot of uh, these days, there's a lot of regulatory issues with respect to, you know, the environment inside of the building. Um, and of course, in, in some cases, a tenant will explicitly want in their contract um, the uh, VOC CO2 levels in, in, in a building. So why are we doing this? Because it's hard to, to extract it, to put sensors in a building, especially in existing buildings, because it can be very costly. You've got to run wires. We're completely wireless. Uh, there's a lot of complexity from the sensors themselves to how you connect it to the cloud, to the presentation of the data and the analytics associated with it. We take all of that complexity away where data is a service, right? So you're only interested in that data so you can optimize your building performance. That's what we do. Um, and accessibility of the data, because it's all uh, collated in the cloud, you can easily access the data. A lot of, today, a lot of buildings have data loggers where you have to go on site, you can't collect that data, you can't use that data, so it's not actionable. So, why do this? Operations are 71% of a building's TCO over the life of the building. Now, life of the building can be from 30 to 50 years. Now, just some basic monitoring of building systems can save up to 15% of annual uh, operational costs. Think of that savings over a 30 to 50 year time frame, right? So it's pretty compelling. Now, so our call to action to you folks in the BIM industry is that you need to link BIM to TCO. So now everyone's familiar with BIM with respect to the design and construction phase, but we would argue that you should extend BIM into the operation and maintenance phase, okay? Now, that's a conversation that is going on. Uh, it hasn't caught a lot of traction, but we think the integration of sensor data into uh, the BIM data 
can be a real game changer for building managers. So just quickly, that's an example of, you know, so you can see there's a BIM model. We would just argue that you can integrate into that model and there are tools available to do this uh, for Revit models as well um, and integrate the sensors. We need the spatial and asset location especially so that we can overlay sensor data um, in, into the, the BIM model and, and give, as I said, the, the building portfolio managers a, a, a more intuitive visualization of their building. So the end goal, of course, is to make all the stakeholders happy and facility managers. Uh, it helps them to reduce maintenance costs. Um, building owners, of course, are focused, uh, laser focused on NOI, uh, tenant retention, and of course, the end user, they want health, comfort, comfort, safety, they want productivity. We can do that with, you know, environmental monitoring, temperature, humidity, that sort of thing, you know, space utilization. So uh, all together with our suite of sensors, we can make everyone in, in the uh, stakeholder family uh, uh, happy. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Continue then. Last Good evening, everyone. Have you ever thought about what it would take to immediately get a downloadable, immersive copy of New York, San Francisco, or Paris that you could use as context in your own computer? I'm Dr. Christopher Mitchell. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Geopipe. I'm here tonight with my co-founder, Thomas Dickerson. We both are working or have finished PhDs in computer science, myself from NYU, Thomas from Brown. And for about the past five years, we've both been really interested in the problem of putting the real world into virtual space. So this is a problem we first got interested in through video game applications. So I was trying to put New York City into Minecraft so I could build my own buildings in a perfect copy of New York in Minecraft. Thomas was really interested in Lego architecture sets, what it takes to simplify a huge complicated building down to a few hundred Lego pieces that do a pretty good job of representing exactly what that building looks like. But working on these projects, we found a bigger problem. We couldn't actually get rich 3D models of the world in the first place. We thought, oh, we can just go to Google Earth, we'll use their API to download models. But as you all probably know, there's no way to actually get those models out of Google Earth. And there wasn't really any other place to get those models either. In fact, we found that even if we could, those models had no information about the difference between a building and a window made of glass that you can actually look through and would reflect light in a beautiful rendering, a tree that could lose its leaves in the winter, and water that could be rendered as a liquid. We, about two years ago, started Geopipe after seeing a number of other people beyond the video game space who were struggling with exactly this problem. So obviously one of the areas we particularly focused on was architecture. We've spoken to about 300 architects over the past two years, and we've time and time again heard that 3D visualizations are increasingly vital in the architecture space, that they let clients connect emotionally to the project. They reduce the amount of iteration you have to do when you're doing things like picking materiality, Having rich data about what's in the world, not just the 3D models, lets you do things like analysis, shadow studies, solar panel studies, et cetera. And that once you get to the end of the project and you need to create beautiful visualizations for sales, marketing, um, and to deliver to your clients, that those 3D models are vital. We're making it faster and easier to get those 3D models. So instead of spending an hour per city block creating just a plain white mapping after going and collecting the data or trying to find building footprints that are maybe out of date, um, or maybe four hours if you have to add textures to that, or 200 hours or months if you have to create an entire neighborhood. Geopipe creates models that you can download in 30 seconds, whether you need a single block as a white mask model, or you need a fully textured, fully detailed model of an entire neighborhood. We allow you to not just get the models, but customize the detail. So whereas the best uh, current alternative we've found is something that produces just these kind of plain white models that have flat roofs and very little detail, even our lowest quality models have complete roofs, as many of the structures as we can find in the world, and even things like accurate terrain and trees. 
our most detailed models add information about all the windows, all the doors, um, every object that we can find with fully textured uh, materiality. We have launched our platform back in October. We now have five cities that we cover in the US and around the world. Um, if you need models for your own projects, you're welcome to go get them today. Um, our simple web interface allows you to easily, in a web browser, browse around what looks like a 3D globe containing our models. Um, you can find the area that you want, select it, choose the level of detail that you need, whether you need the terrain, the trees, the buildings, if you want just those plain white massings are all the way up fully textured, and then immediately download those as 3D models that you can put into your own software, whether that's design software, rendering software, or even game engine. Um, we currently license these models to individuals under a set of plans, depending on the size and quality of the models you need each month. If you're an enterprise, uh, we, of course, work with Enterprise. One of our, our early beta customers is one of the largest architecture firms in New York, and we've had a great experience working with them. Um, we think one of the coolest parts is how it works under the hood. We take raw data about the world, like photographs and laser scans. We apply algorithms, including machine learning, to understand all the objects in the world. And we then turn that into the set of rich 3D models that you can use. Uh, we've spoken to customers who have said that this need for Consistent, accurately detailed models in projects is something that's necessary for pretty much every project. And if we can provide that, that will be helping um, what otherwise is a huge spend in time and money that's really not part of the creative process. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to find me afterwards or during the Q&A. And um, we are Geopipe. Excellent. I'm trying to find out whether the stand-up microphone actually works and broadcast. In the meantime, uh, uh, let's have all the panelists come up here. No, no, this 